Jukes was as ready a man as any half dozen young mates that may be caught by casting a net upon the waters, and though he had been somewhat taken aback by the startling viciousness of the first squall, he had pulled himself together on the instant, had called out the hands, and had rushed them along to secure such openings about the deck as had not been already battened down earlier in the evening, shouting in his fresh, stentorian voice, Jump, boys, and bear a hand. He led in the work, telling himself the while that he had just expected this. But at the same time, he was growing aware that this was rather more than he had expected. From the first stir of the air, felt on his cheek the gale seemed to take upon itself the accumulated impetus of an avalanche. Heavy sprays enveloped the Nan Shan from stem to stern, and instantly, in the midst of her regular rolling, she began to jerk and plunge as though she had gone mad with fright. Jukes thought, this is no joke. While he was exchanging explanatory yells with his captain, a sudden lowering of the darkness came upon the night, falling before their vision like something palpable. It was as if the masked lights of the world had been turned down. Jukes was uncritically glad to have his captain at hand. It relieved him as though that man had, by simply coming on deck, taken most of the gale's weight upon his shoulders, such as the prestige, the privilege, and the burden of command. Captain McWhir could expect no relief of that sort from anyone on earth, such as the loneliness of command. He was trying to see, with that watchful manner of a seaman who stares into the wind's eyes, as if into the eye of an adversary, to penetrate the hidden intention and guess the aim and force of the thrust. The strong wind swept at him out of a vast obscurity. He felt under his feet the uneasiness of his ship, and he could not even discern the shadow of her shape. He wished it were not so, and very still he waited, feeling stricken by a blind man's helplessness. To be silent was natural to him, dark or shine. Jukes at his elbow made himself heard yelling cheerily in the gusts, We must have got the worst of it at once, sir. A faint burst of lightning quivered all round, as if flashed into a cavern, into a black and secret chamber of the sea, with a floor of foaming crests. It unveiled for a sinister, fluttering moment a ragged mass of clouds hanging low. The lurch of the long outlines of the ship the black figures of men caught on the bridge, heads forward, as if petrified in the act of budding, the darkness palpitated down upon all this, and then the real thing came at last. It was something formidable and swift, like the sudden smashing of a vial of wrath. It seemed to explode all around the ship with an overpowering concussion and a rush of great waters as if an immense dam had been blown up to windward. In an instant, the men lost touch of each other. This is the disintegrating power of a great wind. It isolates one from one's kind. An earthquake, a landslip, an avalanche overtake a man incidentally, as it were, without passion. A furious gale attacks him like a personal enemy, tries to grasp his limbs, fastens upon his mind, seeks to rout his very spirit out of him. Jukes was driven away from his command. He fancied himself whirled a great distance through the air. Everything disappeared, even for a moment, his power of thinking. But his hand had found one of the rail stanchions. His distress was by no means alleviated by an inclination to disbelieve the reality of this experience. Though young, he had seen some bad weather, and had never doubted his ability to imagine the worst. But this was so much beyond his powers of fancy that it appeared incompatible with the existence of any ship whatever. He would have been incredulous about himself in the same way, perhaps, had he not been so harassed by the necessity of exerting a wrestling effort against a force trying to tear him away from his hold. Moreover, the conviction of not being utterly destroyed returned to him through the sensations of being half-drowned, bestially shaken, and partly choked. It seemed to him he remained there precariously alone with the stanchion for a long, long time. 
The rain poured on him, flowed, drove in sheets. He breathed in gasps, and sometimes the water he swallowed was fresh, and sometimes it was salt. For the most part, he kept his eyes shut tight, as if suspecting his sight might be destroyed by the immense fury of the elements. When he ventured to blink hastily, he derived some moral support from the green gleam of the starboard light shining feebly upon the flight of rain and sprays. He was actually looking at it when its ray fell upon the uprearing sea, which put it out. He saw the head of the wave topple over, adding the might of its crash to the tremendous uproar raging around him, and almost at the same instant the stanchion was wrenched away from his embracing arms. After a crushing thump on his back, he found himself suddenly afloat and borne upwards. His first irresistible notion was that the whole China Sea had climbed on the bridge. Then, more sanely, he concluded himself gone overboard. All the time he was being tossed, flung, and rolled in great volumes of water. He kept on repeating mentally, with the utmost precipitation, the words, My God, my God, my God, my God. All at once, in a revolt of misery and despair, he formed the crazy resolution to get out of that, and he began to thresh about with his arms and legs. But as soon as he commenced his wretched struggles, he discovered that he had become somehow fixed up with a face, an oilskin coat, somebody's boots. He clawed ferociously all these things in turn, lost them, found them again, lost them once more, and finally was himself caught in the firm clasp of a pair of stout arms. He returned the embrace closely round a thick, solid body he had found as captain. They tumbled over and over, tightening their hug. Suddenly the water let them down with a brutal bang and stranded against the side of the wheelhouse. Out of breath and bruised, they were left to stagger up in the wind and hold on where they could. Jukes came out of it rather horrified, as though he had escaped some unparalleled outrage directed at his feelings. It weakened his faith in himself. He started shouting aimlessly to the man he could feel near him in that fiendish blackness. Is it you, sir? Is it you, sir? Till his temple seemed ready to burst. And he heard, in an answer, a voice as if crying far away, as if screaming to him fretfully from a very great distance the one word, yes. Other seas swept again over the bridge. He received them defenselessly, right over his bare head, with both his hands engaged in holding. The motion of the ship was extravagant. Her lurches had an appalling helplessness. She pitched as if taking a header into a void, and seemed to find a wall to hit every time. When she rolled, she fell on her side headlong, and she would be righted back by such a demolishing blow that Jukes felt her reeling as a clubbed man reels before he collapses. The gale howled and scuffled about gigantically in the darkness, as though the entire world were one black gully. At certain moments, the air streamed against the ship as if sucked through a tunnel with a concentrated solid force of impact that seemed to lift her clean out of the water and keep her up for an instant with only a quiver running through her from end to end and then she would begin her tumbling, again as if dropped back into a boiling cauldron. Jukes tried hard to compose his mind and judge things coolly. The sea, flattened down in the heavier gusts, would uprise and overwhelm both ends of the Nan Shan in snowy rushes of foam, expanding wide beyond both rails into the night. And on this dazzling sheet, Spread under the blackness of the clouds, and emitting a bluish glow, Captain McWhirr could catch a desolate glimpse of a few tiny specks black as ebony, the tops of the hatches, the battened companions, the heads of the covered winches, the foot of a mast. This was all he could see of his ship, her middle structure covered by the bridge, which bore him, his mate, and closed wheelhouse, where a man was steering, shut up, with the fear of being swept overboard together with the whole thing in one great crash. Her metal structure was like a half-tide rock wash upon a coast. It 
was like an outlying rock with the water boiling up, streaming over, pouring off, beating round, like a rock in the surf to which shipwrecked people cling before they let go, only it rose, it sank, it rolled continuously, without respite and rest, like a rock that should have miraculously struck adrift from a coast and gone wallowing upon the sea. The Nan Shan was being looted by the storm with a senseless, destructive fury, trysails torn out of the extra gaskets, double-lashed awnings blown away, bridge swept clean, weather cloths burst, rails twisted, light screens smashed, and two of the boats had gone already. They had gone unheard and unseen, melting, as it were, in the shock and smother of the wave. It was only later, when, upon the white flash of another high sea hurling itself amidships, Jukes had a vision of two pairs of davits leaping back and empty out of the solid blackness, with one overhauled fall flying and an iron-bound block capering in the air that he became aware of what had happened within about three yards of his back. He poked his head forward, groping for the ear of his commander. His lips touched it, big, fleshy, very wet. He cried in an agitated tone, Our boats are going now, sir. And again he heard that voice, forced and ringing feebly, but with a penetrating effect of quietness in the enormous discord of noises, as if sent out from some remote spot of peace beyond the black wastes of the gale. Again, he heard a man's voice, the frail and indomitable sound that can be made to carry an infinity of thought, resolution, and purpose, that shall be pronouncing confident words on the last day when heaven's fall and justice is done. Again he heard it, and it was crying to him, as if from very, very far. All right. He thought he had not managed to make himself understood, our boats, I say, the boats, sir, two gone. The same voice within a foot of him, and yet so remote, yelled sensibly, Can't be helped. Captain McWhir had never turned his face, but Jukes caught some more words on the wind. What can expect when hammering through such bound to leave something behind stands to reason. Watchfully, Jukes listened for more. No more came. This was all Captain McWhir had to say. And Jukes could picture to himself, rather than see the broad squat back before him, an impenetrable obscurity pressed down upon the ghostly glimmers of the sea. A dull conviction seized upon Jukes that there was nothing to be done. If the steering gear did not give way, if the immense volumes of water did not burst the deck in or smash one of the hatches, if the engines did not give up, if way could be kept on the ship against this terrific wind, and she did not bury herself in one of these awful seas, of whose white crests alone, topping high above her bows, he could now and then get a sickening glimpse, then there was a chance of her coming out of it. Something within him seemed to turn over, bringing uppermost the feeling that the Nan Shen was lost. She's done for, he said to himself with a surprising mental agitation, as though he had discovered an unexpected meaning in this thought. One of these things was bound to happen. Nothing could be prevented now, and nothing could be remedied. The men on board did not count, and the ship could not last. This weather was too impossible. Jukes felt an arm thrown heavily over his shoulder, and to this overture he responded with great intelligence by catching hold of his captain round the waist. They stood clasped thus in the blind night, bracing each other against the wind, cheek to cheek and lip to ear, in the manner of two hulks lashed stem to stern together. And Jukes heard the voice of his commander hardly any louder than before, but nearer, as though, starting to march athwart the prodigious rush of the hurricane, it had approached him, bearing that strange effect of quietness like the serene glow of a halo. Do you know where the hands got to? it asked vigorously and evanescent at the same time, overcoming the strength of the wind, and swept away from Jukes instantly. Jukes didn't know. They were all on bridge when the real force of the hurricane struck the ship. 
He had no idea where they had crawled to. Under the circumstances, they were nowhere, for all the use that could be made of them. Somehow the captain's wished no distress, Jukes. Want the hand, sir, he cried apprehensively. Ought to know, asserted Captain McWhir. Hold hard. They held hard. An outburst of unchained fury, a vicious rush of the wind, absolutely steadied the ship. She rocked only, quick and light like a child's cradle, for a terrific moment of suspense, while the whole atmosphere, as it seemed, streamed furiously past her, roaring away from the tenebrous earth. It suffocated them, and with eyes shut they tightened their grasp. What from the magnitude of the shock might have been a column of water running upright in the dark, butted against the ship, broke short, fell on her bridge, crushing from on high, with a dead, burying weight. A flying fragment of that collapse, a mere splash, enveloped them in one swirl from their feet over their heads, filling violently their ears, mouths, and nostrils with salt water. It knocked out their legs, wrenched in haste at their arms, seethed away swiftly under their chins, and opening their eyes, they saw the piled-up masses of foam dashing to and fro amongst what looked like the fragments of a ship. She had given way as if driven straight in. Their panting hearts yielded, too, before the tremendous blow, and all at once she sprang up again to her desperate plunging, as if trying to scramble out from under the ruins. The seas and the dark seemed to rush from all sides to keep her back where she might perish. There was hate in the way she was handled, and a ferocity in the blows that fell. She was like a living creature thrown to the rage of a mob, hustled terribly, struck at, borne up, flung down, leaped upon. Captain McWhir and Jukes kept hold of each other, deafened by the noise, gagged by the wind, and the great physical tumult beating about their bodies brought, like an unbridled display of passion, a profound trouble of, to their souls. One of those wild and appalling shrieks that are heard at times passing mysteriously overhead in the steady roar of a hurricane swooped as if borne on wings upon the ship, and Jukes tried to outscream it. Will she live through this? The cry was wrenched out of his breast. It was as unintentional as the birth of a thought in the head, and he heard nothing of it himself. It all became extinct at once, thought, intention, effort, and of his cry, the inaudible vibration added to the tempest waves of the air. He expected nothing from it, nothing at all, for indeed, what answer could be made? But after a while he heard with amazement the frail and resisting voice in his ear, the dwarf sound unconquered in the giant tumult. She may. It was a dull yell, more difficult to seize than a whisper, and presently the voice returned again, half submerged in the vast crashes like a ship battling against the waves of an ocean. Let's hope so, it cried, small, lonely, and unmoved, a stranger to the vision of hope or fear, and it flickered into disconnected words. Ship. This. Never. Anyhow, for the best, Jukes gave it up. Then, as if it had come suddenly, upon the one thing fit to withstand the power of a storm, it seemed to gain force and firmness for the last broken shouts. Keep on hammering, builders, good men, and chance it. Engines, rout, good man. Captain McWhir removed his arm from Jukes' shoulders and thereby ceased to exist for his mate. So dark it was, Jukes, after a tense stiffening of every muscle, would let himself go limp all over. The gnawing of profound discomfort existed side by side with an incredible disposition to somnolence, as though he had been buffeted and worried into drowsiness. The wind would get hold of his head and try to shake it off his shoulders. His clothes, full of water, were as heavy as lead, cold and dripping like an armor of melting ice. He shivered. It lasted a long time, and with his hands closed hard on his hold, he was letting himself sink slowly into the depths of bodily misery. His mind became concentrated upon himself in an aimless, idle way, and when something pushed lightly at the back of his knees, he nearly, as the saying is, 
jumped out of his skin. In the start forward, he bumped the back of Captain McWhirr, who didn't move, and then a hand gripped his thigh. A lull had come, a menacing lull of the wind, the holding of a stormy breath, and he felt himself pulled all over. It was the boatswain. Jukes recognized these hands, so thick and enormous that they seemed to belong to some new species of man. The boatswain had arrived on the bridge, crawling on all fours against the wind, and had found the chief mate's legs with the top of his head. Immediately he crouched and began to explore Jukes' person, upwards with prudent, apologetic touches, as became an inferior. He was an ill-favored, undersized, gruff sailor of fifty, coarsely hairy, short-legged, long-armed, resembling an elderly ape, his strength was immense, and in his great lumpy paws, bulging like brown boxing gloves on the end of furry forearms, the heaviest objects were handled like playthings. Apart from the grizzled pelt on his chest, the menacing demeanor and the hoarse voice, he had none of the classical attributes of his rating. His good nature almost amounted to imbecility. The men did what they liked with him, and he had not an ounce of initiative in his character which was easy-going and talkative. For these reasons, Jukes disliked him, but Captain McWhirr, to Jukes' scornful disgust, seemed to regard him as a first-rate petty officer. He pulled himself up by Jukes' coat, taking that liberty with the greatest moderation, and only so far as it was forced upon him by the hurricane. "'What is it, Bozen? What is it?' yelled Jukes impatiently. What could that fraud of a bosun want on the bridge? The typhoon had got on Jukes' nerves. The husky bellowings of the other, though unintelligible, seemed to suggest a state of lively satisfaction. There could be no mistake. The old fool was pleased with something. The boatswain's other hand had found some other body, for in a changed tone he began to inquire, Is it you, sir? Is it you, sir? The wind... Strangle his howls. Yes, cried Captain McWhirr, 